Socialist Ends, Market Means. Gary Chartier, 2009. I believe there is a way of understanding socialism that renders it compatible with a genuinely market-oriented anarchism. If socialism must mean either conventional state socialism or state socialism with ownership of the means of production vested in local microstates or some vaguely defined model of collective ownership rooted in a gift economy, then it has to be clear that socialism and market anarchism aren't compatible. But it ought to be troubling, then, that one of the founding spirits of market anarchism, Benjamin Tucker, clearly considered his variety of market anarchism to be an alternative to state socialism as a form of socialism. Words, nod to Nicholas Lash, are known by the company they keep, and I think it's worth reminding readers of the diverse company kept by socialism. I think it makes sense, therefore, to offer a definition of socialism that will make clear why Tucker, at least, clearly ought to be included. With that in mind, then, I suggest that we understand socialism negatively as any economic system marked by the abolition, one, of wage labor as the primary mode of economic activity, and two, of the dominance of society by a, the minority of people who regularly employ significant numbers of wage laborers, and b, a tiny minority of people owning large quantities of wealth and capital goods. We might understand socialism in positive terms as any economic system marked by 1. Wide dispersal of control over the means of production, 2. Worker management as the primary mode of economic activity, together with 3. The social preeminence of ordinary people as those who both operate and manage the means of production. State socialism has attempted to realize socialism through the power of the state. Not surprisingly, given everything we know about states, state socialism has proven in most respects to be a disaster. Coupled with the economic inefficiencies associated with central planning, the secret police, the barbed wire fences, and the suppression of dissent are all elements of state socialism's disastrous record. If you want to define socialism as state socialism, be my guest. Many people do so. But the history of the term makes clear that many people have not meant state control or society-wide ownership of the means of production when they have talked about socialism. Socialism as genus, state socialism as species. There is good reason to use socialism to mean, at minimum, something like opposition to 1. Bossism, that is, subordinative workplace hierarchy, and 2. Deprivation, that is, persistent exclusionary poverty, whether resulting from state capitalist depredation, private theft, disaster, accident, or other factors. Socialism in this sense is the genus. State socialism is the, much to be lamented, species. Indeed, using the socialist label provides the occasion for a clear distinction between the genus socialism and the species state socialism. Thus, it offers a convenient opportunity to expose and critique the statist assumptions many people reflexively make, assumptions that make it all too easy for political theory to take it as given the presupposition that its subject matter is the question, what should the state do? I am more sympathetic than perhaps I seem to the claims of those who object to linguistic arguments that they fear may have no real impact on anyone's political judgment. I wouldn't dismiss as silly someone who said that no market anarchist could employ socialist without creating inescapable confusion. Capitalism, seemingly in the same boat. So the first thing to say, I think, is that the same is true of capitalism. It's a word with a history, and the history is very often rather less than pretty. Consider people on the streets of a city in Latin America, or Africa, or Asia, or Europe, chanting their opposition to neoliberalism and, yes, capitalism. I find it difficult to imagine that hordes of protesters would turn out in the streets to assail poor little old private ownership. When a great many people say that capitalism is the enemy, that's surely because, among many people around the world, capitalism has come to mean something like social dominance by the owners of capital, a state of affairs many people might find unappealing. In accordance with the kind of libertarian class analysis it's easy to find in the work of people like Murray Rothbard, John Hagel, Butler Schaefer, and Roderick Long, Kevin Carson, author of the original C4SS article, and Stephen Kinsella's target, to Kinsella's credit, he is not only blunt but also good-natured, maintains that this social dominance is dependent on the activity of the state. 
remove the props provided by the state, he argues, and capitalism in this sense, the sense in which the term is employed pejoratively by millions of people who have no ideological investment in statism or bureaucratic tyranny, is finished. Socialist ends, market means. That doesn't mean that the market anarchist must somehow have forgotten her commitment to markets. As Kevin Carson, Brad Spangler, Charles Johnson, and others have observed, as a historical matter, there clearly have been people who have argued for the abolition of state-supported privilege and who have enthusiastically favored freed markets who have worn the label socialist confidently. Tucker and Hodgskin wouldn't have agreed that socialism is synonymous with collective ownership. Rather, they would have said, various schemes for state ownership, or for collective ownership by some quasi-state entity, are ways of achieving the underlying goal of socialism, an end to bossism in the workplace, the dominance of the owners of capital and society, and to significant widespread deprivation. But, Tucker and Hodgskin would have said, these are both unjust and ineffective means of achieving this goal better to pursue it by freeing the market than by enhancing the power of the state. Of course, if socialism means state or parastate ownership of the means of production, there is no sense in characterizing Carson or any other market anarchist as defending clearly pro-socialist positions. On the other hand, if socialism can have a sufficiently broad meaning, one compatible with market anarchism, that it makes sense to say that Kevin or another market anarchist does defend such positions, then it is unclear why talk of socialism should be objectionable. Distinguishing Market-Oriented Socialists from State Socialists Carson, for one, clearly supports the existence of private ownership rights, and I have seen nothing to suggest that he would disagree with the claim that market interactions have to feature non-state ownership if they are to be voluntary. He is consistently clear that there could, would, and should be alternative kinds of property regimes in a stateless society, but none of those he considers appropriate would be rooted in coercion. So I'm puzzled by the implication that he's an opponent of private ownership. None of that means that one can't point to despicable regimes, Pol Pot anyone, who've worn the socialist label proudly. But surely if the idea is to point to despicable applications of a term, one can do the same with capitalism as with socialism. Think Pinochet-era Chile. The association of capitalism with mercantilism and corporatism and the dominance of entrenched elites is hardly a creation of left libertarians and other market anarchists. It's an association that's common in the minds of many people around the world and which is thoroughly warranted by the behavior of states and of many businesses and socially powerful individuals. Beyond Semantics So in short, I'm not sure that using socialism as the label for a particular sort of market anarchist project, or of capitalism for what that project opposes, has to be seen as just an exercise in semantic game-playing. 1. Emancipatory Intent For instance, labeling a particular sort of market anarchist project socialist clearly identifies its emancipatory intent. It links that project with the opposition to bossism and deprivation that provide the real moral and emotional force of socialist appeals of all sorts. 2. Warranted Opposition to Capitalism Thus, identifying one's project as socialist is a way of making clear one's opposition to capitalism as that term is understood by an enormous range of ordinary people around the world. The socialist label signals to them that a market anarchist project like Kevin's is on their side and that it is opposed to those entities they identify as their oppressors. 3. Forcing the state socialist to distinguish between her attachment to ends and her attachment to means. A final rationale. Suppose a market anarchist like Kevin points out to the state socialist, by sincerely owning the socialist label, that she or he shares the state socialist's ends while disagreeing radically with the state socialist's judgments about appropriate means to those ends. This simultaneously sincere and rhetorically effective move allows the market anarchist to challenge the state socialist to confront the reality that there is an inconsistency between the state socialist's emancipatory goals and the authoritarian means she or he professes to prefer. It sets the stage for the market anarchist to highlight the fact that purported statist responses to bossism create more and more powerful bosses, that the state is much better at causing deprivation than curing it. Thus, the market anarchist's use of socialism creates an occasion for the state socialist to ask her or himself, perhaps for the first time, am I really more attached to the means or to the end? 
I realize that what I intend as a rhetorical question may not, if the state socialist cares more about power than principle, elicit the intended answer. But it seems to me that for many state socialists, the recognition that the left-wing market anarchist sought socialist goals by non-statist means provides the state socialist with good reason to rethink her attachment to the state, to conclude that it was pragmatic and unnecessary, and that her genuinely principled attachment was to the cause of human emancipation. This means there's a meaningful opportunity for education to highlight the existence of a credible tradition advancing a different meaning of socialism libertarianism, and the socialist vision. Now, it is obviously open to a critic to maintain that she has no particular concern with workplace hierarchies or with deprivation, or that they should be of no concern to the libertarian qua libertarian, since objections to them do not flow from libertarian principles. I am happy to identify as an anarchist who favors markets as well as individual autonomy, but I do not ask myself whether my appreciation for socialism in this case is something to which I am committed qua libertarian. Rather, my willingness to identify as a libertarian is licensed by a more fundamental set of moral judgments which also make socialism in the relevant sense attractive, and which help to ensure that the senses in which I am a libertarian and in which I am a socialist are consistent. At minimum, there seems to be some reason for using the label capitalism, so clearly understood to be the altar of socialism, for the kind of economic system we have now, backed up so clearly by state-granted and state-maintained privilege. But I think it's worth emphasizing that capitalism, both because of its history and because of its superficial content, seems to suggest more than merely state-supported privilege, though surely it implies at least this. It seems to suggest social dominance by the owners of capital, understood to be other than the owners of labor. Now, it happens to be the case that I agree with Kevin, Roderick, and others that this dominance is dependent in large measure on state abuses, but I don't want to simply emphasize my objection to these abuses, though I certainly do object, but also to express my opposition per se to the dominance of the owners of capital thus understood. That's why I am inclined to regard talk of socialism as important, as highlighting at minimum the trajectory toward which the market anarchist project be thought to lead, and as identifying morally important values to which my sort of market anarchist at least is committed, and which do not seem to me like good candidates for the status of particular interests if these are understood as arbitrary, even if morally licit. I am avowedly opposed to the initiation of force against persons and their justly acquired possessions. That makes me fairly unproblematically a libertarian. But that doesn't change the fact that socialism is a term that remains useful for the left libertarian project. I believe that socialism names a set of concerns, related to resolution of what in the 19th century would have been called the social question, that there is good reason for left libertarians wholeheartedly to endorse.